All right, Laura. Um, first, I've, my name is Garrick Perry. I am the chair of the Community Resources Committee. Uh, and I want to welcome everyone to the January 23rd, 2023 uh, Community Resources Committee. I'm very excited for this. Uh, Happy New Year to everyone. Um, with that being said, Laura, could we call this meeting to order? Sure. Councillor Perry. Here. Councillor Elkins. Here. Councillor Jarrett. Here. And Councillor Maori. Here. Yay. Uh, with that being said, I just want to let everyone know that this meeting is being audio and video recorded. Um, <clears throat> I want to thank everyone for showing up. Uh, on our agenda right now, we do have public comment, but I just want to say that I know a lot of people are here for one of the agenda items. Um, and before that agenda item, we're going to have some public comment. So if anyone has anything to say other than about the item that is later in the agenda, please feel free to raise your hand and speak up. <clears throat> All right, I see Jackie Balance has something not to do with the agenda item. Yeah, right. I just wanted to thank the uh, committee for meeting on Zoom tonight. It makes it, um, I, don't, I, I just love being able to see all face to face and to feel like I'm being seen and heard as well. Thank you. Thank you. It, it seems like someone has a microphone on. If everyone could turn off their mics and turn off your cameras if you are not a counselor or one of the guests, please. Thank you. Is there any other one, any, anyone else who has a public comment? Seeing no hands raised, uh, we'll move on to announcements and updates from the committee. Does anyone have any announcements or updates? Oh, wait, Claudia Lefko has her hand up. Uh, all right, Claudia, you have to unmute yourself. Oh, thanks, I panicked and I couldn't find the reaction <laughs> button. So, so thanks, thanks for having me. I'm not exactly sure how to frame this. It has to do with the topic at hand, but my um, concern has to do with what's happening to the various conversations around neighborhood character and housing that have been happening over maybe some years now. It seems the topic comes up at the CPC, it's part of finance, it's part of the historic commission, it should be part of the agriculture, it comes up for comment in all these committee meetings. And what happens to who's collating all that, because it's also coming up in neighborhood meetings. Neighbors are talking to neighbors, and actually neighborhoods are talking to neighborhoods. Sometimes associations are talking to the mayor or to other people in the city council or the city government. And what happens to all of that? That's one of my concerns. Who's keeping track of it? And I want to know um, on that, about, you know, my, my concern, I guess, is about the Barrett group. Is the Barrett group hired to be this, this entity that's going to look at all these, like somehow coalesce all this and put it all together and then make some recommendations? And, and if that is the case, well, first of all, I'd like to know, is that the case? And then secondly, if that is the case, I want to express my dissatisfaction with this because somehow it seems the city insists on hiring these out of town consulting groups rather than establishing a committee that would be a citywide committee of professionals and city officials academics and the public that could actually engage with each other and come up with a way to develop a roadmap that's a bit more organic than somebody from outside the city. So if you could answer the question, I don't know, you probably don't have time now, but I'm just putting it out there about my concern about all the things that have been said now over all these years and through all these meetings, who's going to put that into a roadmap for us. Thanks. Thank you, Claudia. Um, and your concern and question is noted. 
um, and, and hopefully someone will be able to get you an answer to that. I know that I, I cannot do that right now. Um, is there anyone else, since, since Claudia snuck in, is there anyone else who has a public comment not about our agenda item? All right, with that being said, we are back on the agenda and updates and announcements from committee members. Does anyone have any updates or announcements? I don't see any, so I will go. Um, tomorrow, Tuesday, January 24th, the Northampton Reparations Committee uh, in the Forbes Library is having a discussion um, entitled Why Reparations, Why Northampton, and Why Now? Uh, it is gonna be held on Zoom from 6.30 to eight o'clock. Um, and the guest speakers and panelists include Dr. Andrea Vazian, Dr. Usman Power Green, and Dan Kennedy as well as some speakers from the Northampton Reparations Committee, uh, Thomas Weiner, Dr. Sarah Patterson, Sarah Weinberger, and John Berkowitz mm -hmm. are doing that. So um, if you guys are looking for some more Zoom action, please head over there and uh, check it out. With no other updates or announcements, I see. Uh, that brings us to our next item, which is minutes, and we have been asked to table that, so we are going to move that until next uh, meeting. And that brings us to the real fun of tonight, which is our discussion on neighborhood character, energy, sustainability issues, um, building and trees, and our amazing Director of Planning and Sustainability, Carolyn Mish, has again brought us a few local experts to discuss this. We've got Dory Brooks of Jones Whitsitt Architects and Northampton's very own tree warden, Rich Parasoletti um, here. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, does, before we get into this discussion, let's see if anyone has any public comments about this item. We are giving folks three minutes to talk about this. Um, and then there will be time after presentations and discussion to have a, a quick Q and A. Um, so does anyone have anything to say before we get into it? Jacqueline. This is our bitchy neighbor. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen her yet. Okay, hi, um, can everyone hear? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Jacqueline McCraner. I was born and raised and live in Northampton. It is my beloved hometown. I would like to call on all city staff to significantly increase their responsible stewardship of Northampton's precious historic built and natural resources and to work with residents in this capacity closely and respectfully. There are several uh, vital goals and objectives regarding housing, our neighborhoods, their design and character, sustainability, as well as general civic best practices, which I believe city officials should prioritize. Number one, establishing sufficient and properly enforced housing infill design standards. Number two, ensuring housing infill does not overwhelm existing parking, traffic, and stormwater management infrastructure, nor overtax the city's utilities, including water. Number three, maximizing protections for healthy mature trees on both public and private land. Number four, creating an official mechanism for Northampton residents to participate in the planning, permitting and construction oversight processes regarding the development of our historic neighborhoods. Number five, conservation of green and open spaces. Number six, historic preservation at the neighborhood level. Number seven, creating neighborhood conservation districts, also known as NCDs. Number eight, requiring site plan review and special permits for all private developers, regardless of lot size. Number nine, saving our historic, modest, rehabable, moderately priced vernacular single family homes on single lots including our city's inventory of existing historic starter homes. Number seven, uh, I'm sorry, number 10, honesty, democracy, transparency, and accountability in all departments and at all levels of city government. 
Number 11, establishing deconstruction ordinances to responsibly deconstruct homes rather than adhere to the existing policy demolition which leads to a high carbon footprint in order to cart debris to a landfill in upstate New York, since the Northampton uh, landfill is closed. Number 12, becoming a prominent leader in energy efficiency, renewable energy, deep energy retrofitting, sustainability, zero net energy homes, and in the effective responses and creative solutions to the intensifying climate crisis. Number 14, 13, upholding and properly enforcing the tenets of the Sustainable Northampton Comprehensive Plan 2021 and the Climate Resilience and Regeneration Plan. Just a couple more to go here. Uh, number 14, prioritizing the construction of low income chapter 40B affordable housing as well as moderately priced housing. Number 15, welcome new renters and homeowners into our neighborhoods and communities. Number 16, respecting existing renters and homeowners in our neighborhoods and communities. Number 17, promoting growth, progress, change, and a prosperous, diverse, and vibrant future for all. And lastly, number 18, celebrating, protecting, and promoting Northampton as a historic city and destination. I'm a firm believer that we can be doing much more to achieve these goals and that until city officials agree to work more closely and respectfully with residents, our city will not properly steward its historic built and natural resources to the best of its ability. Let's come together and work together to create the truly sustainable and prosperous future that Northampton and all of its residents deserve. Let's create a legacy together that we can be proud of and support Northampton and its resources so that many future generations can enjoy these same beautiful historic homes, downtown areas, streetscapes, and stunning natural vistas. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. So, uh, if I'm just going to interrupt just briefly, the uh, the blue sky timer was late to arrive, but has has arrived. <laughs> so, and I don't see anyone else with their hands up. Um, Councillor Elkins, I don't know if you want to do an introduction to our guests or or a brief introduction and let them introduce themselves. But I'll, I'll turn that over to you since you know them more than I do. Okay. Well, I, I tell you what, I will. Um, I will. Uh, uh, actually, why don't we start um, briefly with uh, uh, Carolyn? If she, Carolyn, not uh, not to put you on the spot, but if you could just kind of briefly outline. Um, Kind of the questions that we pose and the things that we let uh, uh, Dory and Rich know that we wanted to hear about, and then I'll we'll toss it over and let them introduce themselves and uh, let us know what they have uh, brought to share with us. Sure. Um, thanks, Councillor Elkins. Um, so this is a, as people probably know, this is a continuing um, a continued conversation from November when um, the committee first started talking about the housing issues because you had um, been receiving questions and um, information um, from folks and it seemed like it made sense to get people who um, could provide their expertise in sort of answering these questions about um, you know, housing costs, construction costs, and really dive into um, the issues um, surrounding those types of questions so that um, you covered that um, pretty thoroughly with a range of folks um, in November. And then the other questions that seem to have come up um, is um, sort of individual understanding, different people have different understandings of what um, community, community character is and um, what we mean by that and what does the what does the long range plan mean about that? What does the zoning say about that? And um, many times um, there are varying uh, um, degrees of understanding of what that means and um, whether it means, you know, if one new house comes into a neighborhood, does that mean it's changing the character of the neighborhood? And um, and and so the, there have been questions that have come up as well about energy and um you know, what it means um, to build, certainly in the long range, the, the sustainable Northampton plan. We um, have um, specific goals about decarbonization and conservation 
And we know we also have this housing crisis and we know that we um, need that one of the biggest impacts to um, uh, trying to reduce our um, carbon footprint is to concentrate development where we have opportunities to um, expand um, access through um, other means besides just single use automobiles. So um, we know that there's that transportation and building um, connection that we need to address. And that means that we need to be smarter about where we're um, putting housing. And so all of that comes, um, has, has sort of been part of that conversation. And so um, Dory Brooks has um, worked a lot in the energy field as it relates to design and neighborhood character. And I thought it would be um, helpful to have her come and talk about that from sort of a designer's perspective and also an energy's perspective. And um, then I um, talked to Rich Parcelletti, the city's tree warden, to um, come and talk about um, how, how we're, what we're thinking about in terms of trees and those trade-offs and thinking about, you know, where that housing is and um, what kinds of um, tree protection or um, other tools that we can use to sort of offset that and create, you know, walkable, livable, high quality of life uh, neighborhoods, even if that means some um, trees come down um, in town versus big swaths of trees that come down in more suburban areas where new roads and driveways and lots of new infrastructure are required to address that. So um, that's uh, so tonight I asked both those folks to come and sort of talk targeting on those um, aspects. Very good. So I would start with uh, Dory. Uh, and Dory, uh, ask that you introduce yourself, kind of give, uh, if you can, uh, I think many people here know you and uh, I know lots of your neighbors are here. Um, but just tell us a little bit about yourself. And uh, in addition, can you also um, just let us know, because you've, because your firm has also done some things specifically for the city uh, and uh, in terms of consulting and design work and things like that. So, you know, tell us all the things we want to, we want to hear all the things. Sure, thanks. Marissa, uh, hi, my name's Dory Brooks. Uh, I'm principal of Jones Woodson Architects. Um, we're based in Greenfield. I live in Bay State on Federal Street. Um, and I'm uh, both president of the firm as well as currently happen to be, just coincidentally, uh, president of AIA Massachusetts, which is the professional association of architects in the state, which means that while I'm not here technically speaking on behalf of the profession, I, I have a little bit more angle or window on the professional positions relative to neighborhood development and um, carbon emissions and our policies towards carbon emissions and our policies towards code, uh, building codes, and can speak a little bit to some of those positions as well, because I think they're, they're kind of relevant to the conversation that Carolyn asked me to speak to. Um, my our firm has been in the Valley for 35 years or more, 40 years almost now. Um, we were predominantly a schools focused firm for a long time, but um, over the last 11 or 12 years, we've moved also towards focusing on housing. And as a res resident of Northampton, I was particularly interested in um, the zoning bylaw changes that happened maybe 15 years ago um, and how they were gonna affect the city and got uh, involved um, with the small lots big ideas competition years ago that happened in Northampton and curated that program that happened at APE um, and then got involved with Habitat for Humanity, exploring small infill development opportunities in the city as a way of showcasing what we could do. Um, and also partly as a part of that, wanting to understand the, the economics of housing in this day and age. And I'd say, you know, behind all of this conversation is, for me, the understanding that as a society, we've been essentially living off of borrowed time for a long time relative to the environment, that we've been basically using oil and natural gas to, to afford a kind of a lifestyle that's pretty hard to afford um, uh, for our climate and our environment. And the, the kind of, we've, we've hit that point in our history where um, we're, we're having to make harder and harder decisions. And you see that in 
infield development debates where the cost of housing um, is up against the need for more housing, which is up against the need to, um, to improve the, the quality of the buildings we're building in order to not lose energy from those buildings unnecessarily. And all of this is creating a stew of conflict. And I think our, our neighborhood and our city are facing a lot of the same conflicts that the whole country is facing. Um, I, I'm going to take a step back and say that I got into architecture. Actually, this is a second career for me. And how I got here is actually that I was living in Madison, Wisconsin. And I lived in a neighborhood that Madison's a very progressive environmental city. And in that city, there suddenly was in, in our neighborhood an infill pressure when some public property was going to be sold on the market. And my neighborhood reacted in a really um, hostile, kind of anxious, anxiety provoked way against anything happening. And we we organized and, you know, kind of in a way sort of sharpened our own pitchforks to try and stop anything from happening. And it became a very adversarial relationship and it really could have been detrimental to the city as a whole. But what we were lucky to have happen is that the city had invested in neighborhood organizers. Um, because they wanted to strengthen the neighborhoods in the city. And rather than, you know, as, as um, Claudia was mentioning, rather than outside consultants, this organizer did a great job of helping us actually facilitate a conversation about um, broader issues so that it, rather than it be, what's what am I afraid of happening in the neighborhood? It became a, a larger understanding of what we needed in the community and brought parties together. And, and we actually kind of over many years actually managed to successfully create a, a, a really uh, wonderful project that was ended up developing a parcel that was a remnant parcel into, you know, um, co-housing projects and community gardens. And that was kind of remarkable. None, none of us saw that happening, but we had to first own some of our um, hostilities and own each other's issues. And that's what got me interested in architecture at the time. Um, and it's why our firm kind of thinks of ourselves as community builders more than just architects. What I'm interested in is not offering a design solution to people, but actually seeing people come together um, to work together to figure out design solutions. Um, so that was just kind of backdrop um, so that you understand where I'm coming from, I think. Uh, I want to just jump in and share a couple images. And what I want to talk today about uh, is, is my perspective as an architect and some of the ways architects are looking at these issues today. Um, because we we share many of the same concerns, you all do, um, but we also have a lens on it that I think not everybody else does. And that is actually having to be the people who draw the buildings, draw the designs that the buildings uh, that you see get made. Um, and and some of the pressures that we're seeing happening on our side that are regulatory. I want to talk a little bit about um, what I see as uh, the role, the scope that we have as a community to define some things. Like, what do we get to regulate? And what don't we get to regulate? And we're, you know, I think in this committee, you all have talked a lot about regulating um, the 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 shape and form of zoning, um, the streetscape. Um, and that's one area of regulation, but there's another area of regulation that we collectively control, and that's within the, the building envelope um, through building codes. And I think those are actually also relevant to this, but you might not have thought of that. So um, I'm going to jump and just share a couple images. And I didn't really plan this, um, uh, you know, over a great deal of time. I just pulled some things that I thought were interesting to talk from. I'll try and be quick. I'm not always quick. Um, so uh, if you all can see this, I'm Can you see that screen, Marissa? Just want to be sure you can see it. Yeah? Yes, we can see it. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Go to full screen. So this is uh, on the left is a 1736 image of Rome. Um, and it's interesting because I love architectural history, um, but it's it's kind of significant to architects and planners because it represents a kind of a change in perspective at a period in time when people weren't ever thinking from that perspective of looking down at the city. It's called the Noli Plan. And the Noli Plan shows the difference between the open and closed space of a landscape. So the closed space being what's inside the building and the open space being the, the, all the stuff in between. And in a way, planners have, have have always been engaged in kind of governing what's in between and talking about the things between um, the open space of parks and then the streetscape and the sidewalk 
And the question always is kind of where does that regulatory boundary end between the open space and the, the front stoop and the wall um, of the house? Uh, and, and to some degree, the question of neighborhood character is always a question of like, what feels good as a whole? What is the rhythm that feels good? When we when we talk about form based zoning or uh, narrow lot lines, you know, we're kind of really talking about what is the relationship between volumes and how do we get that right in a way that that actually preserves a sense of um, kind of community while also respecting the individual's uh, right to privacy and sort of self governance within their own property. Um, and I think that's that's some of what we're talking about here. And then this is an image um, that I, I heisted from Carolyn, actually. I've seen this presented by the city. Um, and I think it's, it's to, to go from the Noli map to this, the green areas of this map, this is Northampton, obviously, and green are our open space, permanently governed open space. And that's the area that, that our city council has the greatest kind of influence over. Those are decisions that have been made over time to protect open space. And from these large open space areas where you have a great deal of you know, yeah. to all the way to the edge of the sidewalk and the street and the boundary, that's the, again, that territory that you're trying to talk about. What, what role do you have in really um, shaping each of our, our neighborhoods uh, within that? And I think this is just interesting to me because one of the things I love and the reason why I live in Northampton is because of this open space protection that's been done by the city. I'm super grateful for the plan that put that in place. And I understand that part of that is kind of a compromise. It means that there, there, there will not be development and those areas have been permanently protected. So again, that idea that we have this kind of gradient from the open space all the way to the sidewalk, that's where the city planners are working, really talking about, and, and the city council and trying to figure out, we want walkability, um, we want parks, um, um, we want sidewalks. You know, I live in Bay State, we have um, a certain amount of openness between residences, but we don't have sidewalks. We have kind of challenging situations and when, when the streets redone, some of that comes in, some of it doesn't. That's part of the overall goal of the city um, to try and, and manage those things. But within the lot itself, the state actually influences a lot of what happens within the building. Um, and I think it's interesting to think about that side of it too, how that um, governance of what's happening inside is relevant and how it pushes out. So what's between the two, between what happens inside the building wall and what happens at the street front, the edge of the street, um, that's really what we as homeowners, um, we get to control. And I guess the question of like, how much are, are, are you or any jurisdiction gonna try and set limits on the decisions that we make in creating a design for our home? Or if you hire an architect, telling an architect what they have to do, what guidelines they have to meet to decide the form of the house, um, the, the, the design guidelines relative to how the, the front door sits, um, where the kitchen is, how things relate. Um, that's that territory that historically um, in the US, we've really tried to shy away from doing too much governance of um, for a lot of reasons. Um, there have, obviously there's a history of redlining and there's a history of exclusionary um, kind of um, mechanisms to try and limit um, certain things happening in neighborhoods that have actually kind of then led to problems that people didn't anticipate, or perhaps they did, um, to control who who can develop where and how they can develop. So it, 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 I think the AIA's position has been strongly to kind of shy away from that type of over-regulation because it will limit the development of housing that's sorely needed. Um, and because of the history of how some practices of uh, exclusionary zoning have really um, un left people to feel unwelcome or have raised the cost. You know, so historic preservation districts even are kind of controversial sometimes because they can actually immediately raise the assessed values of properties in historic districts, which then make them exclusive. So it's a hard line there. There's also just that general question about what we have a right to control and what you can control when society is constantly evolving. So you may assume that the form of a house, you know, is something that we can all agree on, but in reality, um, 
mores and social preferences for housing and how we build houses and live in them has have changed over time. You know, we no longer have the same uh, history of placing the kitchen in a small, distant part of the house as a sort of a service area because you know our notions of gender have changed and the role of the kitchen has has changed with our notions of gender um, and the kitchen is now a more central part of the house. So, so can we safely guess what the future is gonna hold and how that's gonna change? I think that's an interesting question, but to get to the energy question specifically, I wanted to talk about that inside wall, that inside element where our state actually puts a lot of regulations in place. So the Massachusetts Building Code has only existed since 1975. So all the homes built in Northampton prior to 1975 were built when there was no building code here. Um, and since 1975, there have been nine additions to the building code. And each one has um, increased the expectations on designers and designs and construction um, relative to different things, life safety, energy, um, you know, plumbing codes, electrical codes, uh, and, and each time the code is updated, it becomes a little bit more complex uh, for architects and engineers um, and a little bit more expensive, frankly, to be honest, because all those things just create constraints that have to be met. Um, but they've all done, it's done that for good reasons. And the, the energy code and stretch code are a particularly good reason, example of why code is valuable. So we all know the code is there, you know, for life safety reasons, but for stretch code, um, which recently actually passed again, so we now are on our second stretch code, I think, um, the 2023 stretch code, what we've been aiming to do collectively is um, reduce energy waste um, by having rules in place that influence how we design a building. And I think that's relevant because you can't compare the design of a building built in 1910 or 1940 to a home built in 1920 in, in 2023 because they're they're built to entirely different standards. So not only have our social mores changed and how we use the house changed, but what we have to do to build that house has changed. And that has impact not only in the cost of the house, in the energy use of the house, but also ultimately in the form of the house. So just as a quick update for those of you, this is my um, sort of public service announcement for the day. Um, so I've been obsessed lately with trying to understand what the impact of the new stretch code is, and I'm sure other architects on the on this call are as well. Um, and just this is a hard thing for folks who don't understand it, but the HERS rating is a rating that decide that essentially you're attempting to meet, have to meet um, on the uh, the actual energy conservation level essentially of your home. So again, you know, under stretch code, under these new changes, we, we currently um, typically have been aiming for a HERS rating of 52 for a residential construction, and that's dropping 10 points to 42. Mm. So, so, you know, is that 20% better um, energy conservation in our new construction <laughs> homes, as well as a jump down, you know, from our, our current requirements for alterations and additions down to the current level. Now, that's kind of hard to follow if you're not an architect probably or a builder, um, but, but what that's meaning is that we have to actually construct the walls of the building differently to seal the house and the floor of the building differently and the roof of the building differently in order to try and air seal and conserve energy by putting insulation outside the envelope of the house um, and keep it as sealed as possible. So a home, my home, you know, here in Bay State, you know, is a 1940 home built prior to the energy code with a four inch stud that had zero insulation. And I've spent, you know, years now and a lot of money trying to get it to the point where I could achieve that kind of rating. And I, I could not, even after probably spending, you know, I'd say over a hundred thousand dollars on insulation and solar panels, I could not have achieved the HERS rating of the new stretch code for new construction, maybe for renovation, but probably not even that, um, because we just don't have this wall thickness, you know, available to us for insulation. I'd have to, to build inward or outward to create this level of insulation. We're talking continuous insulation on the outside. This is just a, a typical wall that we, we do nowadays for residential construction and a six inch construction wall infilled with insulation in the middle, insulation below the slab, 
and significant insulation above the roof uh, in this in the attic area. Um, and those those things are are kind of pushing out and shaping the house. I'm not saying it's necessarily making the house, um, you know, a thousand square feet bigger. It's making the wall bigger, and it's it's impacting how builders build um, because they're not only trying to achieve this, they're also trying to meet the needs of your typical, you know, single family or or couple um, for the kitchen to be where they want it to be, the bedroom to be sized the way you want it to be. And I think all of these things are pushing costs up. And that's part of why we, we feel that pressure, that new construction that sometimes doesn't seem that, um, that um, satisfactory aesthetically is actually kind of impacted by the, the requirement that it meets these things, you know, and compromises are being made in places that a lot of us don't want to see made. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a reality that builders, I think, are facing. Um, so, you know, this, um, Jackie shared this image with me in email today, and, and I, I, I thought it was interesting because it actually kind of illustrates all of the things that I've been talking about so far. It illustrates what I, I know here in Bay State, we feel as a tension around this new construction, um, that the area between buildings, you know, is really important to the sense of character. Um, and that's true, but it's also occurring partly because of um, some of what's feeling like a pressure for builders to meet a market desire um, for a single family home while also meeting the, the, the energy conservation requirements of that construction uh, that is very, very different than this house over here that is kind of being compared somewhat, somewhat in my sense, in my view, falsely being compared to this new construction because this home was built in an era when there was no need for insulation, no requirement. Um, there was no requirement for this kind of wall and, and times were different. Um, so I think the ideal of building houses to the scale that are as energy efficient as this, um, that are affordable um, is going to be very, very difficult. You know, So it's, it doesn't seem as possible as we might hope it would be um, without tremendous subsidy and creating constraints on that could make it even more difficult for us. So I think it's an important conversation you're trying to have about how we balance these things. And the more we can do collectively to have a conversation that, again, uh, poses a willingness to listen to all sides and, and kind of own all the issues, I think, of open space and energy conservation and housing requirements and housing needs, you know, the more likely we are to kind of come to a resolution as a, as a community as to what makes sense. So I'll, I'll stop there if that's we'll leave that in. Yeah. And maybe if anyone has any questions. Does anyone, does uh, any of the counselors have questions? Uh, we're gonna we're gonna do counselors first uh before we do any public things. I saw Council Mayori had her hand up. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Dory. This is I'm finding this fascinating. It's such a great foundation, excuse the pun, for um <laughs> For, you really, I find it, I'm finding it very illuminating. So I'm just trying to clarify, are you saying to kind of uh, make um, housing and um, buildings more energy efficient, uh, they actually have to be physically larger? I mean, because the walls have to be thicker or are you saying, you know, to encompass, is that what you were um, saying I, with that? I think it's a balance. I'm, I'm trying to be empathetic to the, to the, the traditional builder who's struggling to meet a market need for certain certain amenities within the home while simultaneously having to meet um, the requirements of the building code, which require greater investment in the envelope of the building. Yes, the outside wall. So um, so if you if you take your average 1800 square foot home and now you have an even thicker wall and a thicker foundation, not only does that impact the, the, the helm itself and say the attic space, right? That attic is no longer unimportant. That's actually a hugely important part of the building, you know, for your typical residential home. Regardless of what style you're designing to, you know, those things matter now and they have to be baked into the design, but they also impact the cost of the housing. So, right. you know, you, so both of those things are, are, are relevant because it's, uh, it's constraining some of the flexibility a builder might have to achieve other things that, that, that we may as a community wish they could achieve. Right. Oh, well, thank you so much, Dory. Yeah. Carolyn. 
Yeah, I just had a, a couple of um, comments and then another question for Dory. So maybe I'll just um, start with the um, comments. Um, so, you know, you mentioned that, and I think um, what's important to understand is that in order to get us out of this housing crisis, the developers are the ones who are going to be building the, these homes. I mean, we need housing on a scale that's um, uh, more than just a one-off single family detached home here and there. Um, and I think the question you raised, you said, um, you know, who can develop with the rules about who can develop what, when, and where, and who decides, and the concern about um, dipping into some exclusionary practices that um, we have all experienced as a country and understand that we don't want to go back to those days where we're picking, uh, selecting a few people um, to determine who gets to come in what neighborhood and how what the standards are for that neighborhood. So one of the things that we try to do in the regulations is sort of create that balance, generally uh, establish the framework for what people, what the community has decided is important for design and is it form and had that intersection between street and um you know the private space um and and so part of that is also thinking about the gaps and taking opportunities to um, look at some of those gaps and the rhythm along streets and we know that neighborhoods are not um uniformly built out you have sections of blocks where the housing is really tight together and then you have for you know decades had a little bit more space between homes so that question about um, understanding what it means to sort of look at some of the character in the neighborhood that may be different down the block than it is on your block does that mean that if a house then come or a multifamily even comes into that space is that changing the nature of the um, and the character um and so I guess the, and then, so I just want to make those comments. And then the question, I guess, um, would be, um, um, you know, I think you have um, worked a lot on um, looking at sort of making, um, creating opportunities for both you know, high energy efficient buildings, but accommodating more than just um, single family homes and sort of how we might think about character. I think you touched on this a little bit that, you know, there's that tension about how much control does a community or regulation does a community have on those walls. And, um, you know, you were part of a conversation going back several years, I think you mentioned this, in looking at the two family um, design guidelines and, and definitely we had lots of conversations about how much regulation of that design is too much. And, um, and so I think it would probably just be good to hear from you a little bit about that distinction between sort of building design and neighborhood character. And so does the design of a building really affect the neighborhood character and how? Um, I don't know if you have comments on that. I think we all have our own individual opinions about that. I think most architects generally frown on, um, on strict design guidelines because we find that um, really constraining for our clients. You know, we have clients who are going to have a range of, of, of preferences and stylistic interests. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't look to and try and, and relate in context, you know, and the reason I showed that Noli plan is because I think all architects will typically start a project by looking more broadly and pulling out and trying to understand not necessarily what the house next door looks like, but where the front of that house is and how it relates kind of on the lot to the street um, so that they fit in context. So, so the, the Noli plan of field form is still something that we do to understand the scale so scale does matter a great deal to architects all the time. Um, it doesn't matter what style we're doing. We're trying to kind of fit within scale. And, and a lot of battles happen when one sees that somebody's done something and feels out of scale. Um, so I, I respect the need to have this conversation. Um, you know, I think that part of the debate right now is that anxiety about scale. But I, you know, but at the same time, I'm also trying to say that I do understand that 
the city has an obligation relative to its commitment to open space to utilize and enable land to be utilized well where open space is not being protected, you know, in the more congested parts of the city where there may still be room for development. We're enabling that open space to retain, you know, and we want to build um, effective communities. So there's, I, you know, Bay State's a funny area. We have a lot of these landlocked um, hunks of land that make us feel more rural than we are. Um, and they're, many of them are ultimately protected. They're kind of internal to the block. Um, but there's also stretches along the block that are actually um, uh, are, uh, large lots that you know are actually much larger than your average lot that could support a second home. But it's that fine grain of like where does it become you know over congested versus under congested? That's the whole debate that we're having here. Um, but I think there are certainly opportunities throughout the city, and I I understand that what's being asked of us as residents is that we accept some compromise, you know in order to enable other things to happen. So I'm encouraging that, that conversation to really support why is that conversation happening? Yes, it's a compromise to have um, a private uh, lot developed in a way to create a second home possibility, but that allows an infill that creates a home that supports a city um, as a community and protects that open space. And I think promotes the walkability ultimately. So. I, I agree that we want to protect a certain grain of that, you know, and look at this closely from, from a larger perspective to be sure, you know, we still preserve a sense of character. But to me, that character matters more at a form and open space level than it does by particular design guidelines. You know, I've actually gone to the city with significant complaints when I've had to develop, you know, design uh, a home on a parcel that is oddly shaped. And the design guidelines the city has say that the front door must face the street. Well, sometimes that just doesn't work. You know, this is New England and the contours and the shapes of lots are ridiculous. You know, it's not the West where everything is a grid. You know, so sometimes the best intended guidelines that the city's developed have been very, very difficult. And we've done something really beautiful, but we've had to come and say, look, are, are you sure you mean this? And it's like, well, it was a general idea. How do we work around that? And we've had to compromise. And I hate that sometimes, but I actually think that the compromise is, is, is important because we, we all have to kind of own the larger agenda that we set out as a community. Um, so I, I guess I'm kind of a glutton for punishment. You know, those compromises I think are important to make. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I generally, I think most architects um, are anxious about design guidelines because they, they're overly restrictive. Um, and I think from the back to the historic character thing, for me, the point I'm trying to make about building today is that um, it can be a bit of an illusion to think that you can um, reproduce um, homes of a different period where the standards and the mores of society and the building technologies and the cost of materials were entirely different than they are today. I just don't think uh, that's a very realistic prospect. And in 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 kind of promoting an unrealistic idea of a sort of historicist ideal, I think we're, we would actually be making a really um, restrictive um, condition that would make it difficult for us to create homes for people. And I'll also say our firm investigated working on single family homes with Habitat and also worked with a developer on Grove Street to create, to try and explore affordable, multi-unit small-scale homes and in both cases we were really disappointed to see the cost of doing that you know for habitat the only reason it was possible is because the labor was free if labor had been a part of it the housing would not have been affordable you know the the single family home uh, that was an 800 square foot home it really doesn't hit the price point for the person individual who wants to live in it without that subsidy of, of free labor that habitat's providing you know, and in the 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 other development, it was a a private developer trying to create modernist homes on Grove Street that that I designed, and they 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 had a they aimed originally for a much lower price point, but they also wanted um, you know a very high insulation value and wanted not to have um, natural gas in the project, so they wanted all electric uh, resources and uh, heating and cooling, um, and that project ended up far beyond what I would consider affordable. You know, so. 
I just understand the pressures that developers are are facing. And it's why our firm has stopped doing that kind of work and is now focusing on multifamily because it's actually the most resource effective way to produce housing. That's not to say that, you know, that that's a different conversation entirely, but I, I think Northampton has been really uh, progressive in trying to promote, uh, you know, affordability in multi-unit housing while at the same time um, protecting open space where it can and protecting, you know, walkable neighborhoods, um, single family home and, you know, two family home neighborhoods. Councilor Elkins. Oh. Dory, uh, could you talk a little bit more about your, it's, I found it interesting that you had a personal experience, but uh, also, um, you know, obviously sort of beyond that, uh, but about retrofitting homes. Um, I, I, it's been argued by many folks that sort of the costs of, and the, the associated costs of, uh, of demolition and sort of the landfill costs and the waste costs um, relative to um, new construction that <clears throat> what it's been suggested that that retrofitting is obviously more um, efficient and and it's it seems to me that uh, it might cost that the costs obviously seem a great deal more for new construction but the um, but I'm intrigued or I'm interested in what you have your thoughts on the idea of whether or not we could ever achieve with retrofitting what we can with new construction. Um, and then the other sort of second part of that is, uh, sorry, I know you're about to ramp up, but I want to add a little bit to that is, you know, it is also, an, uh, it's almost a different part of the calculation of the demolition and the carting of stuff off and the, the, the waste and, and, uh, uh, carbon usage associated with getting rid of the, the, the waste from the demolished home. So, um, so please um, fix all those things and tell me about it. <laughs> well, you might be surprised by my answers here. So, um, so I uh, I actually do think that this is where the, the I'm. For those of you who don't know, I'm actually kind of really irritated by the stretch code because it's so focused on electrification and so inadequately focuses on carbon. So, in pushing electrification, we're pushing everything off, assuming the grid is eventually going to become carbon neutral or you know cleaner of carbon and right now it isn't so we're we're putting everything on electrification to solve the problem um, but we haven't really done anything to acknowledge the the carbon value of our properties those that exist and and in in creating these higher requirements on the stretch code if i go to do a, a renovation of a building and i have a a, a building of, of low value you know the code is making it more necessary than ever that I spend more money to 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 insulate that building because it's triggered by the the assessment value of the property into requiring that I meet this stretch code, which is quite expensive to do, um, and in Massachusetts is a real challenge for many of our historic properties because they're owned by nonprofits that that really kind of may not have the capacity to do that renovation. So it's almost a deterrent to the kind of renovation work that we want. So it's it seems good, right? And it is good. We want you know renovated buildings to be more energy performing, better energy performing. Um, but it, this new stretch code this is the first time that we've actually required existing buildings to sort of uh, achieve some of those energy requirements um, in the stretch code. And that's going to actually, I think, in, we expected to see a real push for renovation by this period. Um, we expected the costs of everything to be so high that every it makes more sense to renovate. But the code push in the stretch code is actually going to have the opposite effect because it's actually going to make renovation so costly that if you have to compromise in other ways, well, you might as well build new, you know, because it's very difficult to get to some of these um, HERS rating requirements in commercial, you know, I do a lot of school work and the, the schools uh, that we want to renovate that were built in the 50s, 60s and 70s now are so costly to achieve these energy goals, it's cheaper to tear them down. Um, what would help is if the, the carbon that is embodied in those buildings were valued in our tax assessments or were valued in our building code in such a way that that would actually not be you know, the case, that that would actually be an incentive to hold on to them. Um, so we aren't there yet at a regulatory level, 
either at the city or the state level um, to understanding how to um, really incentivize renovation properly and put the put the money towards it and value the carbon of those those resources. Um, the AAIA is working really hard to try and advocate for legislation on that. And actually, you know, we've uh, we've been working with Senator Comerford to try and propose legislation relative to that. We've also actually been trying to revisit the preservation uh, laws, Mass General uh, laws, um, around demo permits in order to try and and likewise um, strengthen those to actually um, create more disincentives to demolition. But but in the environment we're in right now, those regulations actually are not helping to kind of preserve existing buildings either, you know, uh, 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 there's, as we saw downtown in Northampton, many developers, it's cheaper to tear it down and pay the fee, you know, than it is to, to endure any delay, you know, than, than it is to actually go through the process of trying to accommodate, um, you know, the desire to preserve. So the only way we, we haven't, we can't change that tonight. But I do agree that those are actually issues that really need to be addressed to 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 make it um, more of an incentive to to protect existing buildings. So if I could just follow up briefly uh, with one, and um, <clears throat> I, this is more of a kind of a yes or no question. I put a pen in it for later. Um, do you and although I hope you will say more than yes or no, uh, is, do you see? Um, do you see a role at the municipal level for things that can be done, or is it much more at the state and federal level uh, for that, for, for what you're talking about? That's a great question. No, I, I advocate strongly at the state level because I actually, one of the reasons why uh, I, I've been frustrated by the stretch code and the municipal opt-in code is that we've created a regulatory environment in which there's too many different regulations. So as an architect, I have to work in different communities that now all have the potential to have different codes, you know? So when every community sets up their own rules, you know, this is why housing choice as a policy exists now is to try and limit the ability of each community to constrain, you know, housing development in, in such an individualistic way, town by town. Um, and it's the same with the building code. If we have a, a municipal opt-in code in Amherst, and not in Northampton, and then we have a, a base code that's not even a stretch code, you know, in uh, Conway or something. You know, it becomes very difficult for the developer or the architect to work consistently. You have to basically spend more time in each environment adjusting to the individual regulations. So I think some of these issues, like you know, embodied carbon and how we get in, into the code, how we develop um, you know statutes that work at, uh, in order to promote housing or protect open space. You know, the more we do at the the state level, frankly, to develop consistency, I think the better, so that we don't end up being a community of haves and haves nots, where the communities that can afford um, to put in place regulations that are, again, potentially exclusionary, you know, then push themselves out of the market. And and you know, you might argue that Northampton, to some degree, by being a progressive community that has regulated a lot of um, a, a lot of its you know, has has is a stretch code community. Uh, you could say that to some degree that that adds to that kind of cost difference that we have. I mean, I think we're investing in good things, right? We're investing in walkability, um, but it actually all those things together do make it a more expensive place to live. So, how much do we want to keep kind of layering regulation on top of it? Um, and I think I'm often angry that architects sometimes say oh, you know, these things don't have costs. They do have cost. you know. They don't have cost over 50 years, but they have cost tomorrow, you know? So as much as I, and I'm, I'm in favor of the stretch code and our energy code requirements, but I'm, I'm just saying we have to actually own what that means, you know? There are costs associated with those things. There are constraints and there's a need for compromise, you know, all the way through. And if what we're trying to do, going back to the original point, if we're, what we're trying to do is essentially form successful communities in an age in which we're trying to avoid destroying the planet, you know, we have to be willing to compromise along the way as a community. I hope that answers. I'm not sure it did. <laughs> uh, it will engender future conversations. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, thank you. I, I do see there are three hands up. Uh, I've taken note that's Claudia uh, left go and I have both of the Jackies down um, in interest of time, I am 
actually going to move on to our tree warden, and then we're going to come back to you guys for questions. Uh, we'll give you time to ask them to Dory or both Richard. Um, but, but thank you guys uh, for understanding. Uh, thank you, Councillor uh, Perry, and uh, thank you for having me uh, at this uh, important meeting. Um, just a little bit about myself. Uh, I am the city's tree warden. Uh, I'm also a 30-year employee of the Department of Public Works. Uh, I'm the Forestry, Parks, and Cemetery Superintendent. Uh, I'm also the chair of the City's Urban Forestry Commission. Um, I've been the tree warden uh, since 2014. Um, it's been quite a journey uh, these last years. Uh, I have worked very closely with the City's Urban Forestry Commission prior to being a commissioner. Um, and actually all matters related to public shade trees uh, and uh, the city's urban canopy. Uh, we've worked collaboratively, collaboratively with uh, planning and sustainability on multiple um, ordinances uh, related to zoning that uh, included trees, tree protection ordinances. Um, we, the commission also developed a, a series of uh, public shade tree regulations that uh, enforce, uh, help enforce MGL 87 on public shade trees throughout the city. Um, we've done a lot of work and I actually think it's sometimes I, I don't think about how much work we've actually done as, as a group and how far we've come um, in actually sort of a very short period of time, considering that when I first came here in 1989, there was no urban forestry program. Um, there were no tree protection measures. Uh, the city was not planting uh, any trees, and if they were, they were very um, minimal in comparison to all the tree removals that we have done um, uh, during that during that time frame. So, you know, I I, I basically I don't have a presentation uh, other than I'm more than willing to take uh, questions uh, from anyone who is, has questions. That's easy. Uh, does does anyone of the councilors have any questions? I apologize because my my screen is freezing. Uh, my internet is having a thing. So it looks like Carolyn has raised her hand. Carolyn. Yeah, I'm sorry. I hope I'm not jumping in front of any councilors. I just thought it'd be interesting, Rich, if you know. Um, you could talk about uh, you mentioned you know tree planting along the um, within the public rights of way that you have been um, working on more and more I think so and that some of that planting has um, you know you've gotten resources from various places to to purchase trees and um, and uh, use volunteers to. Um, um, to help plant those, but some of the resources for that has come directly out of the tree replacement um, regulatory framework, which um, requires people who are removing trees um, of a certain size to um, replant or make a payment into the um, city's tree planting fund, some of which has been used in um, along public right of ways and in parks and things. And I just wanted to highlight that because, of course, one of the other parts of this that goes hand in hand with sort of encouraging um, more walkable um, neighborhoods and also accessible and walkable um, routes between neighborhoods and commercial districts or schools is to look at replacing those um, shade trees that have come down in the public rights of way so that um, we are building out a canopy for the future and that it also becomes a pleasant experience for people in the community to walk. So that there is, um, you know, in, 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 we know that it's much less likely that people will take those other modes or walk if it's if you're in the blazing sun and um, you don't have any kind of protection from all weather, you know, snow, rain, or sun. So I just wanted to highlight that too, that that's sort of part of the integration and the conversation about sort of balancing, um, you know, directed tree planting and replacement as, you know, trees, um, mature or taken down for new housing, which also accomplishes another, can provide um, another important resource for us. Th 
Th th thank you, Carolyn. You are correct. Uh, the Urban Forestry Commission developed a five-year uh, planting plan, and one of the priorities, the main priority of our planting plan, was to uh, relief uh, streets that actually had direct um, routes uh, to school, um, any uh, type of uh, bus stop, bus shelter. Um, we also identified places that had been had tree removals that were not re were not replaced. Uh, to try to help mitigate the city's urban heat island. Um, we just worked uh, hand in hand with planning sustainability to uh, replant uh, trees along Main Street in Florence, where we actually used a combination of uh, structural soil uh, as the sidewalk panels were replaced and removed. Um, the contractor put structural soil back into the, uh, the tree wells and we planted, I think, eight new trees uh, along in, in Florence. Uh, and, you know, we, we've tried to, the, the commission, um, you know, uh, one of the things that obviously being an arborist, I mean, there are, um, and I wear multiple hats, but it's interesting because I, I was not an, ar I'm not an arborist by trade. That was not my, uh, what my degree was in college. I was a, had a degree in plant and soil sciences and I was a, a turf guy. So I sort of evolved over the, over the years and realized that uh, while turf is wonderful, trees are much better. So I have stuck with trees uh, for a very long time. Um, but you know, the, the challenges of actually trying to manage um, an urban canopy in a city, even though, uh, you know, Northampton has 28,000 residents, we have about 10,000 public shade trees. Um, it's very challenging. Um, there are a lot of, um, there we have a very mature uh, canopy. Um, there are many trees that are over 30 inches in PBH that were probably planted in the probably 1920s uh, in response to the uh, uh, Dutch elm disease and um, pre some trees previous to that in response to uh, the chestnut blight, although I don't think they planted too many chestnut trees and street trees. But managing, trying to manage that canopy and provide and find a balance um, with, with all the other draws on the infrastructure that we have um, and especially the topic that you're talking about is you know, new home construction, by right construction, density housing, and also um, projects that fall under uh, the uh, significant tree ordinance that are in the purview of uh, the planning department. It's, it's quite a challenge. Um, and I find it very challenging at times to, you know, when we, we try to preserve mature trees in the best possible way that we can, but they mature trees, housing footprints, driveways, uh, ADA compliant sidewalks, they're all trying to basically occupy the same space. So it becomes very difficult when you're trying to uh, construct something that is static infrastructure, all while trying to preserve dynamic infrastructure. Because the way that I try to look at trees, um, and I look and I try to explain this to folks wherever I can, whoever will listen, is that trees are, you know, they're dynamic, they're, they're living. Um, they are, they, they, they cannot move. Um, and they are a piece of infrastructure that is just as important as your fire hydrant, as your water main, as your street sign, as a telephone pole. And I think if, if, we, ha if we look at them um, as more of a, a, a dynamic asset that is constantly working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, I think, you know, people hopefully will, We'll think about that before they actually want to either remove that tree or severely trim that tree or decide that they want to remove trees um, you know so they can build um, a, a particular building in a particular place instead of actually thinking about well how can I actually fit that building into that space and try to keep as many trees as possible on that particular uh, property so I, I, I encourage people to really think when designing um, and I'm not a designer I'm not an architect but I really we like people to think the, the long game about trying to actually find this natural balance between the needs of density housing, for example, and uh, the existing canopy um, that surrounds these places where density housing is being constructed. So those, I mean, there's all kinds of challenges. I mean, there's the challenges uh, with the drought actually is, is another very scary challenge. I read an article in the Washington Post the other day about the city of Sacramento, California, that has uh, been uh, <clears throat> very proud to have uh, thousands and thousands of very mature uh, street trees. This last storm they had that came off the coast of California, it, they, thousand street trees were destroyed and, and fell into people's homes. And, and one of the reasons these street trees are 
having this issue is A, because of their age, the constant drought, um, the constant heat. So these large mature trees, their root systems really start to shrink as they get older because the tree can no longer support them. But you have this multi-ton tree next to your side of your house or in the street. And we have uh, an unrelenting uh, weather patterns these days. And so you have trees that potentially uh, can fail. So it's, it's really, it's, it's sort of like being like a doctor. I, you have to manage these things and sort of, and, and you know, you can't ask the tree how it feels. You have to sort of diagnose it all. And then you're trying to, trying to prevent uh, damage to root systems during construction, trying to provide proper tree protection, trying to educate folks on proper tree protection measures. Uh, I deal a lot with contractors and trying to get them to uh, um, think about uh, air spading and root pruning root systems before they stick an excavator in the ground. So it's, it's very challenging, very busy, uh, very exciting. Um, so it's, you know, I, I could go on for hours and I don't think we have hours. So I think I'll just, and Dory, I, Dory where's Dory? She's here somewhere. Dory, you're really very interesting and uh, very interesting segue. Uh, thank you. And to what, uh, what you're talking about. I, I find that I've learned so much from listening to folks, uh, I think it's important to really have a dialogue about this because, again, we're we're trying to find the best possible solution to balance the existing canopy that we have, the existing infrastructure that we have, and also find um, the right level of of density housing or the appropriate housing to meet the needs of residents while trying to make this a very sustainable community. So it's definitely challenging, but it's ex it's really important to have this dialogue. Council Jared. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rich. Um, I really appreciated that, uh, the detail there. Um, I had a quick question about, you know, about, about the census, kind of the census of trees and how, how with our public Alex, I'm not sure. Is anybody else having difficulty hearing Alex? Yes, I am having an issue yeah. too. If you could start again, Alex. Maybe if you turn off your video. Alex, you might you might need to cut off of your, your video. It's it's breaking up pretty severely. There's a little peak going on. Yeah. I think that problem. I'll raise my hand even when all of this seems to be. Sounds like auto tuned. <laughs> Hello, Max Headroom. <laughs> For those uh, older, uh, well, I got I'm, the I'm looking at the average age. <laughs> I don't think I went out of the range here. No. <clears throat> Alex, are you there? Are you are you are you working on this? I don't want to move past you. Well, he has another uh, I'm meeting to be on. Maybe. Well, perhaps uh, Rich could. I don't know if we got some sort of the question out of there about the census of trees. Maybe we could. Maybe Rich could, you know, take a stab at it, and it might not be what Alex was asking, but perhaps <laughs> would. <laughs> but it looks like he's he's gonna come back. So all right, I I can wait then. I won't. Uh... What happens to the best of us? Um, maybe while Alex is uh, coming back, if I, I have a, this is a kind of a straight up arborist question, not, not yeah. a big uh, picture question. Um, so Rich, I know um, <clears throat> when I was on the planning board, um, and, I, and I've also saw, I think recently, one of the hill towns lost a bunch of trees and there was, uh, and, and there were folks who were talking about how the replacements at the sort of uh, thin diameter um, that is required is, you know, just no substitute for, of course, these old trees, which of course they're not, 
But I wonder if you could talk just a little bit about that. I feel like um, we were up against that a lot on planning board where people, you know, very earnestly wanted to save trees, but when a tree had to go, they were very disappointed. They're very disappointed and, and not incorrectly would talk about how that's not a direct replacement and how many years it would talk for the carbon offset to, to equal the tree that was cut down. Um, and of course, um, we learned some things in the context of that uh, in terms of what kind of tree can make it and what, you know, and the, the risk of planting bigger trees. So if you could talk just briefly about that, um, I'd like to hear more about that. Sure. Um, so um, what you sometimes, what ends up happening is that uh, obviously trees, you know, trees, like I said, are dynamic, they're living things. So depending upon, um, you know, when I, when I look at a tree, obviously there's multiple things that I look at. Um, I look at the tree's condition. I look at the tree's age I to try to determine its age, its size, um, the location where it is, and then um, trying to better understand, um, you know, with very difficult, which is difficult. You can't really tell how long a tree is going to live for, you know, an inspection really is only good for the particular moment that you're actually standing in front of the tree. Now, <clears throat> with that said, um, you know, we, we make every effort to try to preserve trees um, during construction projects. Um, and when trees cannot be preserved and they have to be removed, um, either through, uh, if it's a public shade tree, through a public shade tree hearing, or if it's a, um, um, on, on private property or actually um, under the uh, significant tree ordinance, um, you know, the replacement of a 30 inch tree with, with one one inch tree, obviously you are not, um, anywhere near um, going to be having any of the, you know, offsets of that 30 inch tree that you lost. Um, <clears throat> it's very difficult because I think people, um, and including myself, are very concerned about the fact that we are losing these very large trees at a time when we actually need these large trees to hold this sequester carbon and continue to operate to sequester as much carbon while also providing all the other benefits that they provide in the urban environment. So really, I mean, uh, for for example, the uh, Urban Forestry Commission, um, we have a, um, um, tree, a tree mitigation scale that we use that uh, we, we measure the diameter of breast height, which is four and a half feet off the ground. And we determine how many one inch trees can fit into um, a 30 inch tree. <clears throat> and so if someone were to ask uh, to remove a public shade tree and the process move forward, um, they would have to pay for the mitigation for that tree at that four and a half inch, four and a half foot level off the ground um, area. That does not include the canopy, that does not include the maybe large co-dominant stems that it has. It's just that small area. So um, it, it would take so many trees to replace a 130 inch tree. Um, there would there would not be enough place to plant them all. And so it becomes very it becomes very complicated um, or very disheartening is when when you see a large tree being removed because of some development or and and then you come back and there's only two or three trees planted in in in, in its place. I, I think one of the things that we have to remember though is that we we cannot replace the tree in its entirety, but whatever um, the construction code is for the particular building that's being built may actually have some offsets um, that 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 tree uh, you know if that was not the construction didn't happen there are some offsets that that particular construction may have for the tree so you could actually reduce the amount of trees that need to be replaced um, so it's a very it's a very difficult conversation um, the reality is is again as I said earlier it's a compromise I think we have to think about everything is a compromise in life. Um, and um, I think it's important to try to maximize the amount of tree replacements that um, that, that we could that we could do for a large tree. But it's also very important to try to to recognize the fact that if a, a very large tree has to be removed because of a construction project or because it's going to be irreparably damaged, um, even if we try to save it by root pruning, that in the end the tree actually may end up um, dying because of the work that's done, even after we've spent all this time to try to um remediate the root damage sometimes they have to be removed and that's unfortunately um just how it has to be because you create um you could potentially create a risk of failure that is not acceptable to the whoever is the owner of the tree 
I don't know if that answered your question or not, Marissa. It was kind of long, a long answer. I'm sorry. It was less of a question, specific question than than uh, that. I I always like to hear more about how that process and weighing of of competing interests uh, kind of kind of plays out. So, Council Chair is back. Welcome. Yay. Yes, and can you all hear me? Yes. All right, I think I fixed the problem. Um, so yeah, my question had to do with a census of understanding where we were at, um, both with public shade trees, which I think we have a really good idea of the census of public shade trees, but our overall tree canopy in the city and then our urban tree canopy, um, do we have a sense of how much we're losing or and, how, and then how much we're replanting? Um, and because I think that would help us in weighing these, these different priorities uh, to, to understand that. That's actually a very good question. And, and one of the goals um, for the Urban Forestry Commission this year is to get a better understanding of, um, as you said, the overall city canopy um, and its actual, um, and the density of the canopy. So I, I had a little um, work done by you know, a US Forest Service, Dave Bloniars, um, the city's overall canopy citywide is about 58%, um, which is fairly good. However, said when you, we also did a, a uh, he did, we also broke it down to the uh, urbanized areas of the city. The canopy uh, is reduced down about 48%. Now, these are, these are numbers based on iTree, um, iTree analysis, the same data points were used over, uh, again, um, but I think uh, we're in the process of trying to under, better understand um, canopy loss over a period of time in Northampton and actually how where the canopy loss has happened, um, potentially understanding what caused the canopy loss. Was it, uh, you know, was it construction? Was it home building? Um, uh, was it uh, roadway uh, construction? Um, sort of like uh, the, uh, I can't think of the name of the street right now. It's off of Birds Bay Road. It was a lot of trees were removed. Anyways, I can't remember the name of the roadway, but <laughs> um, so I, I think we do have a good handle on our urban street trees. What we need more information on though, which would help guide us, as you said, is the health and the density of the overall canopy. And I think the, the other thing too that is interesting is that um, since the city has adopted density housing, uh, density zoning, we, we don't really have um, a metrices to necessarily capture the tree canopy that's been lost um, during due to by right construction, which I think would be an, an interesting metrices to understand, um, and it would help guide um, help guide policies um, surrounding that possibly that that might make um, that that might mitigate some of that that canopy loss if if there is such canopy loss. Great. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, I unfortunately have to go to another meeting. Um, I will be sure to watch the recording and look forward to all the questions and answers. Thank you, Council Jarrett. Enjoy the next meeting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do any of the other councilors have any questions or? Seeing there's not, uh, I will thank some of the participants for their patience and let's go back to people who have had their hand raised and Claudia Lefko if you're still here I don't oh, I see you Claudia you were first with your hand up um let's get you to unmute yeah yeah thanks I was first but actually um uh, Marissa asked the question that I was going to ask about about um, you know renovation versus demolition. But now as I listen to all of this, I feel like the whole question of renovation versus demolition is kind of complicated. So I'm not in Bay State. I know a lot of people are, are dealing with Bay State issues, but the question, when, when you demolish a house in a neighborhood like I live in, in Ward 3, this small house, the famous 107 William Street, What's going to go up there is a very large structure and we don't have the infrastructure to support it. So we're incurring, I would say, extra expenses by demolishing the house rather than keeping a small house that was, it wasn't even a thousand square feet and, and, and renovating that to, to get it good enough. I mean, I guess there's some code demand that you have to bring it up. Like I'm very, 
scared by your story uh, <laughs> of how much you've invested to try to, you know, insulate your house. But you know, you hear what I'm saying, the cost, you're losing, you're losing the, the, the streetscape, the view of the streetscape for the neighborhood. You're putting additional pressure on the infrastructure, which may have to then be changed in response to the fact that you've demolished the small house to put up this big one. And so, you know, I guess it's it's a balancing act, but but it's for for me, it it seems like we cannot raise ourselves up to these incredible standards that are being put forth. That better if we could bring everybody up a little bit to be very energy efficient, to use less energy, to improve the sidewalks in a neighborhood so that people could actually walk where they need to go or ride the bike. Because as it goes now, these quote unquote insignificant houses are being knocked down and it's well, and they're not being rebuilt for who knows what reason right now. But I'm just curious what you have to say about that. It's not just so easy as the new house. And in fact, one last thing that I've read a study actually that that compares these, this 23 reasons that uh, historic preservation is not a bad idea. I don't know if you know the study, but they claim in here that actually any house built, any building be, built between before 1910 is actually more, uh, energy efficient and sustainable than any new building you're going to build now in terms of the long term cost, the cost of all of this. And so so it's not so easy as just, oh, yes, do this. Yeah. So I'm sorry. It's a complicated question. That, that's what I mean about like the, the, the carbon value of a, a home in 1910 and many of our early 20th century construction techniques were actually of higher quality. The materials were often of higher quality in some cases, not all, you know, than buildings built in the 1970s. You know, we struggle a lot as architects with buildings built in the um, late 60s, 70s, and 80s, um, which are younger and should be better, but are actually just by virtue of the way the global, you know, material market uh, had evolved actually kind of poor performing and may right. often because of air conditioning right and, and how cheap oil was that there was not an effort right. um, you know you have better daylighting in older buildings often you know and you can't overgeneralize, but that's that that is often you know the experience but i think what you're talking about the value of that materially from such an early era um if you were to fully you know, retrofit it would be very high it would it would be an expensive prospect that would pay off over a very long period of time but i mean the unfortunate thing is claudia we don't get to decide what uh, that private homeowner in that small home you know we can't force people to to keep these you know kind of inconsequential houses as you're talking about you know and and in this day and age i think that there's just we, that's where I was saying that the what is the gradient of influence that we have and where does it stop? You know, and it is unfortunate to see, particularly, you know, I think those those more interesting houses of the early 20th century, um, what what potential do we have to actually shape that and stop that without becoming overly regulatory and overly preservationist to the point of creating unexpected consequences along the way when that's an in, that's a privately owned entity who has you know certain sort of opportunities to use the value of that land you know i have a large enough lot that i could conceivably put an adu on my property and didn't we as a community decide that we wanted to allow the private homeowner that potential um, because it suited our larger goals. And, and what, what would happen if the neighborhood decided that that wasn't okay? You know, does the neighborhood get to regulate my rights as an individual um, to use my land that way? I, I don't know. I, I just think it's a slippery slope to start, you know, kind of pushing that. Sorry, you're muted, Claudia. It, sorry, I won't go on because I we could. This is a long conversation, but somehow it seems from the planning department with this de particular development, the person, the developer, was encouraged to build to the maximum. And so I guess what the people in my neighborhood might be looking for is from the planning department or city councilor or whatever 
entities that are doing this, the people who decide this was an insignificant house, that there's some some breaks put on it while all the pros and cons are looked right. at, especially right. in and that I think is an over regulation. I think that is wiser regulation mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll just quit with yeah. that but thanks and, a lot i do i do think we need what we probably are agreeing on also is that if there were more more ability more incentive to support um retention of existing yeah. buildings that would be helpful and we are lacking that I, I strongly agree and in your neighborhood i think i look at all those beautiful large homes that are much too large for an individual you know, and at least we're creating ways that they can, I think, be appropriately reused to support more than one family or or household. Um, that's not that my end of mod view. That's, that's <laughs> Pomeroy Terrace. We're in the other mm -hmm. end. We're in the our house, a thousand square feet. The house they knocked yeah. down. We're in the small house area. Thanks a lot. But look, my husband wants to sneak in now that we have the floor. Sorry. Yeah. I, I, thank you. I just have a quick question. Um, uh, giving your description of the incredible requirements of new construction on site, um, I'm wondering if there's any uh, evolution, any positive evolution in the in the industry of modular and prefab housing and so forth that uh, would enable people to uh, conceivably buy buy a home that was manufactured off site that would meet these requirements but would be you know, significantly less than having it built on site. I'm just curious about that. It's there is there's a lot of enthusiasm for that, um, and we keep an eye on it and and look at modular for not only um, you know single family or or but also multifamily construction. And I've talked to folks at CET Center for uh, you know our our local energy folks here who have really looked at that and studied it very closely and found that in our environment our climate. Um, a lot of those construction techniques are really relying on good taping technique, right? Because you're ending up putting units that have been built offsite or, 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 or pieces of buildings have been built offsite, and then you're connecting them on site in the field. Mm. So you're really relying on how are you how are you masking over those seams, essentially, and do you trust those technologies? So when they've done uh, uh, blower door tests, that's been the weak point. So I think in New England, we're in a pretty tough climate. We haven't quite perfected those techniques in a way that has made them as um, kind of cost effective uh, and reliable as we want them to be. Um, but it's it, it's largely about the cost of labor that makes that so appealing, right? You can stay indoors and develop them and then move them site. And eventually the cost of labor gets to the point where that's gonna make it even more enticing and, and we'll see more of it for sure. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, I made it back. So I was about to take, I was about to take uh, the reins, but go ahead. Thank you, thank you for being there. Um, Jackie Balance, I believe you were next. Just gotta there we go. I know we're over in overtime and it's been a great discussion. I want to say a few things real quick. ADUs are great. We have uh, some ADUs here in Bay State and every one of them has been um, a fit the landscape. It's not, they haven't been a problem. And uh, Rich Parcelity is the best tree warden in the whole world. We are so lucky to have him. Uh, I wanna speak to Dory's Madison, Wisconsin experience uh, where the neighborhood was up in arms and there was all this adversity and Finally, there was some mediation and a conversation and people talked to each other and came to a win-win. That's what I think is special about the Neighborhood Conservation District idea is that neighbors and developers are compelled to talk to each other and work things out. And it's been successful in Cambridge for more than 40 years into that statement um but we do need to guide the three words you said that struck me reform open space and scale and these are the kinds of things that will inform a neighbor's care neighborhood's character and help to preserve what makes bay state for example special we we all so many of us care about our history we care about each other we treasure um 
last the six deer that curled up in my backyard last week. They grazed and then they it started to rain. So they sat down six deer in my own backyard. That is such a sacred moment, a blessing of living where I live and the sort of thing I feel called to preserve. And I know from the last round table that there are ways to make affordable starter homes. Wright Builders has done it in Greenfield. Uh, they did something good on Hinkley Trace uh, before COVID and before the prices went up sky high. But it, we can do it if we can be creative. Um, there's things like these three printing 3D houses. Once you buy the machine, the houses go up real fast and real cheap. I don't know. We've got to think about outside the box, business as usual. We don't have time for business as usual. The climate doesn't allow it. Thank you. All right, it looks like there was no question in there. Thank you, Jackie. Um, and thank you for trying to keep that one brief. I'm gonna say again, we're, we're nearing the end. Uh, Jacqueline, you are next. All right, great, thanks. Um, a quick thanks to Carolyn, all the city councilors, Dory, Rich, um, and everybody else participating remotely. Uh, I really appreciate this conversation. And Rich, I'll be super excited to see um, the stats that come back on determining what the tree canopy and how that, what it is and how it's changed um, since the 2013, 2014 uh, URB uses by right and zero or reduced lot line zoning ordinances uh, were implemented. But I agree, um, I think less than wanting to uh, um, set down in really hard terms what people can design for their homes or not. That's not so much of an interest to Northampton residents, I don't think. I think we are more concerned about scale and setbacks. Um, Dory, when you were pulling up the, um, the 170 Federal Street doesn't fit. Uh, <clears throat> I think that Jackie Balance had sent you. I, was, I wasn't sure if I understood correctly or if it was a bit misleading because you were saying it sounded like that those two homes that were built, um, it wasn't kind of fair to compare them to the existing home that was sort of set in the background on the, on the right-hand side of that photograph. Um, saying that you know the walls of homes need to be thicker now for energy efficiency due to the stretch code if i have that correct but um you know uses by right the the 2013 urb uses by right and reduced lot line zoning ordinances have reduced drastically setbacks and so maybe um that comes into play with that particular um image and what jackie was trying to say with the doesn't fit um, but also another question or a question that I have for you, because I too haven't um, heard before of the stretch code affecting existing structures to this degree, um, where they need to be brought up to high levels of energy efficiency. It, does that kick in if the renovation is 30% or more, or is that any renovation that's done to a home now that it'll have to be brought up to a really, you know, high level, the stretch code level? I um, I actually haven't looked yet on the residential um, addition renovation level. I've been focusing mostly on the commercial side and that would apply in the, the commercial side, yes, that if you are doing 30% of the assessed value or 30% of the area, you would, you would trigger that. So that is new and that's what's kind of tipping that up. I mean, for good reason, just, right. just gonna be difficult consequences. Um, so would you- yeah, you have no uh, idea whether uh, residences will have it a threshold. Be, it should be applicable there as well. And uh, Elon's on the call, I see, and she may have already looked at some of some examples because we all have a variety of different project types and clients. But I believe it would be applicable as well. I can actually get back in touch with you and let you know. Um, that would be lovely. I can I can reach out to you. Uh, in the coming days. Yeah, and it actually, the good news is that the, the residential code um, triggers, they actually sort of stagger in. So it's not immediate, it, it's kind of, go, it, it, they, they lift over time over the next year. 
So okay. until July 2024. So that's helpful. But um, yeah, if you're thinking about um, your own right. relations, you know, it's, it's important to know. <laughs> yes, I'm starting I to sweat. <laughs> you know, as good as they are, it's also very difficult for the, the building commissioner to manage all this complexity of regulation mm -hmm. as well. So. Dory, I really appreciate you too speaking to um, working with Joe Comerford uh, about um, incentivizing mm -hmm. uh, rehabilitations and renovations. Is there a way for the public to be more tuned into that discussion? Um, I'm sure that um, Joe will speak about it as as she unveils her next you know next set of bills. Um, and I think it's, I view that bill, particularly the one focusing on carbon as something that's going to be kind of a slow burner because there's just a lot of education that has to happen. And frankly, it's one of those things where there isn't a standard within the in industry as to how to, um, how to account for um, carbon and life cycle analysis. Uh, so I think it's going to take time for that to really be done well. And I'm, I'm kind of active on it simply because I want it to be done well and not just be kind of rushed out in a way that, because I think sometimes we, we do things for the right reasons, but, um, but without the, the due diligence necessary and we can see the challenge. And, and... Oops. I think you muted. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I hit the bar. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I can't really speak to the 170 Warner because I'd have to look at it from a different perspective. I, it's certainly true that the zoning has has changed the lot lines. And I know the there's been a lot of discussion about where's a, a zero lot line or, uh, and I think that that's the conversation the city has been having uh, and in adjusting that. And I, I think that's an appropriate conversation to be having um, in this group and as a whole. And, and we do have to come to a, a agreement. As I said, on a property we were working on, the lots are very different in the city because of the topography. They're, they're, it's not as easy as, um, might be assumed when um, uh, a zoning regulation is put in place. They don't always apply everywhere well. And I think 170 is an example of how, um, you know, the, the specific characteristics made that really difficult. It did not feel probably as everybody expected it to. Um, so that's a conversation I think continues to be had, but that that is different than kind of, um, I think, creating a, a preservation district that that prohibits um, some of that infill from happening potentially. So I think there's a range of solutions that we're all just trying to talk about. Awesome, thank you. Oh, well, last thing I will say that just um, kudos to Alex is discussing uh, ways of looking at affordability as a whole that are different, right? So talking about um, you know uh, community land trusts as a way of actually kind of taking the cost of, of of the land itself out of the equation. Those are, are also things that I think Northampton, you know, is looking at that would be beneficial to this conversation. <clears throat> Looks like we have one more hand and that's John Hansel. Good evening. Um, I'm the person who built the house on Warner, in fact. And the problem I see right now is the fact that everybody wants their cake and eat it too. Um, I always get the thing about saving trees, but then everybody wants solar. Basically, what does the city of Northampton want? You can't have both. Um, at great expense, and Councilor Elkins can attest to this because she's on the planning board when this happened. You know, I had to keep the trees over at 6 Warner Street. It cost me a few thousand dollars because I had to aerate them, like uh, Mr. Parsletti said. And I had to protect them and you know, fence them in. And then the buyer came along. And the first thing they said to me is, I want those trees down. I want solar. So you, after spending all that money, they went down anyways. Um, it's, it comes to a thing where you can't have everything in life. You have to accept that something's going to go. Uh, it's, it's just not going to work out. And then the thing is also where the fact is, you know, they're, they're talking about the, the cost. The cost of build right now is astronomical. And now they're adding more cost to it. And people always talk about the cost of wood, which has come down, but they really don't talk about everything else that's gone up so much. And then the first question everybody always asks me is, are these affordable houses? If they only know what they cost to build today, and now they're adding more, you know, more into the house, it, it would kind of like, it, it would, you, I don't think you would believe it unless you were doing it. 
And if I told you the cost, you wouldn't. Uh, it's just, there's so much going on right now where everybody wants their own agenda and you can't make everybody happy. Uh, you know, it's just, uh, and when they talk about saving these old houses, I took down number 61 Warner Street. Who are these people that are going to come in and fix them up? Who's going to have the money to do that? It's developers that do come in and do something with it. And we're not a nonprofit. If we don't see a profit, where are these homeowners going to be that have the money in their pocket to do this? You can't, there's just so many things I'm hearing that don't really make sense because even with Wilson Street going down, who was going to go in there and fix that place up? I, I, uh, who are these magical people that they keep talking about? Uh, it's there's just so much out there when they talk about modulars. I start off in modular houses; they're expensive. The hidden cost of the crane, the hidden cost of transportation, the flag cars, the set crews. Yeah, it looks cheap when they advertise it in the paper, but the reality of the world is it's not. And that doesn't even get to the fact that the like they were talking about the passing the energy codes. There is just so much out there right now that people just don't always understand it. And I saved trees over at uh, Liberty, 8 Liberty and Riverside. Now that people bought 8 Liberty are saying I should have cut down the tree and they want the tree down. And I'm like, if you only knew what I went through at some of these meetings, I was saving as much as I could. And even though one came down in a windstorm and I still think they're, I don't think they're safe. It's, you can't have everything and try to make everybody happy is never going to happen. More so in Northampton than other places, but it's a, it's, it's a juggling act. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, seeing no other questions, uh, I just want to thank both Dory and Rich for coming to this meeting. Um, and I also want to thank Carolyn for organizing not only this meeting, but the last one. Um, I know that I am still swimming with all the information from the last meeting, so I have more things to think about now. Um, and I also want to thank the public for coming to, to turning out for, for this meeting. I think this is a very important discussion. Uh, one of my reasons when talking with Councillor Elkins and Carolyn Mish about doing this was to have this as sort of uh, the start for these conversations and to also have a record for for people to look back and gather and gather this information uh, it's one of the, the things that comes with the pandemic and these recorded zooms is that we do have a, a an actual record um you know that we can kind of piece together and parse out so um thank you everyone for being a part of this that will close up our discussion on neighborhood character and sustainability issues um our next item is items referred to committee. We have none, so then we have new business. Does anyone have any new business they want to bring up or discuss? All right, I, I know uh, particularly myself, I, it's a new year, so there should be some new business. Um, I, I would like to sometime in the future bring in uh, some representatives from Northampton Vibrancy Project to kind of discuss some of the things that have been going on in our city around you know dealing with the issue of some empty storefronts and things. So. Um, you know, that's something I, I would really like to, to do. And hopefully, if, if you guys have anything that you want to bring up in a meeting, feel free to you know, message me and, and let us know. Um, that being said, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. <clears throat> Second. All right. Motion made by Councilor Elkins and seconded by Councilor Mayori. Laura, roll call, please. Oh, you're muted, Laura. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. And Councillor Mayori. Yes.